Large robots and more hacked video game controllers, this time on Hack 5. Hey everyone, Glitch, and welcome back to Hack 5. If you recall back to the before times, in fact, before the last DEF CON, I had done some videos on hacking a Nintendo Power Glove to be a controller for my large robot. That was a a riot and at DEF CON I had a lot of fun driving it around. Post DEF CON I intended to get back to this project and expand on it. However, between moving across the country and a few other things, I never got around to it. And then the world did the thing the world did that we're not supposed to talk about on YouTube, so we'll skip that. Now that we're finally getting towards the end of that whole fiasco, I'm getting back to the robot. Now I'm still down in Texas, and a couple days after this video goes up, Dallas Hackers is meeting. This is going to be my first meet since things happened, and I am stoked for it. So I got the robot back out of mothballs, and we're fixing it up. Now I've made a few changes. Uh, actually at DEF CON I wasn't driving it with the nunchuck because I was worried about controllability and predictability. The nunchuck's a great gimmick, but it's really only suitable for outdoor spaces. It can be a little subjective. You're not really telling the robot where to go. You're giving it a suggestion of what to do. And so I needed something a lot more accurate and a lot more predictable. And that's why I modified my Nintendo nunchuck. Now this is a Wii nunchuck from, you know, the Nintendo Wii, the whole hit console where you can find these things in thrift stores for two or three dollars now. And I lobbed off the connector end and connected that to an RF Nano. That RF Nano is in a 3D printed box with a little LiPo battery and a charging circuit and a power switch. And that's it. I used this to drive the robot all around DEF CON and never ended up talking about it. I think I did do videos on the Power Glove. I'll link those down below. However, I wanted to talk about this because this is a lot more practical, approachable, affordable, versatile. And I imagine some of you have projects that you are looking for a perfect, simple controller for. The great thing about this controller is I'm able to fit it in my pocket and make it look like I'm not controlling anything. And so I had a lot of people wondering if the robot was autonomous, hopping in front of it, trying to screw with it. And ultimately, they never really figured out until either I walked up and did something with the robot or whatever. That's a really cool trick. If you're doing any kind of like cosplay or uh, you've got a robot character like a Wally -E or some other R2-D2 or something, having an easily concealable controller is great. And I also intend to use this for some drones and other projects coming up. Now before we get started, this is mostly going to be a code review. However, I'll have the schematics, parts lists, and everything else in the description down below. In fact, they will be linked on my Patreon. I have a Patreon over at patreon.com slash glitchtech. I don't intend to paywall anything. I believe information should be free. So I'm just using that as a repository to host things. So everything's accessible and open. Just go over there, download it, and if you want, contribute while you're there. Let's get started. First, let's have a look at the receiver code as that will make the transmitter code I use on both the power glove and nunchuck, which are now on a unified standard, make more sense. So this is mostly the same as when I did it back a couple of years ago. However, I did add a few important things. There is now a dedicated kill switch functionality without interrupting any of the other PWM channels. And basically all that's doing is looking for a kill switch bit, either zero or one, to be set. And that then completely disables the loop. So the first thing that happens in the loop is check the kill switch data variable. And then that is being taken care of if kill switch one, reset data. Now reset data is a function that was already I already had in the code and basically all that's doing is setting all of the channels to 127. 127 in this case is the center value between zero and 255. As far as the motor controllers and servos and almost everything in the robotic space, that is a safe center value that turns everything off. And basically the whole loop just gets canceled out if kill switch is set to one. Now kill switch also or reset data also gets called if the last receive time is under or is over 100 milliseconds and that's a heartbeat packet. So if you go out of range, it won't stick with the last data. It will be like, oh, I haven't got any data for 100 milliseconds. I'm going to 
enable reset data. This does make it vulnerable to jammers. You could just flood the spectrum and disable the robot. But considering this is meant to be used in con spaces and not in hostile environments, which in hindsight, I guess DEF CON is a hostile environment. And look, real quick, let's speak on the hostile environment thing. This doesn't have any encryption. There is a bit up here, which I change after I do a video to make it a little more difficult, uh, that sets the address. And so the NRF module is using a predefined protocol. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. I think it might be FSK. But it uses this bit here to determine whether or not it should listen to a, uh, a transmission, whether the transmission is addressed to it or not. It's a bit like a MAC address on a network. The transmitter is transmitting that beacon that beacon is then being like, oh, I actually do want to listen to this transmission, takes that data packet in, and then your code does whatever with it. Outside of that, there's no other security or encryption. Supposedly, it's possible to do some basic AES stuff, like 64-bit, I believe, on the Arduino. I want to play with that because obviously, as the robots get more popular, there's going to be people out there wanting to do things to the robots. And I don't want you to do things to my robots because they're my robots. So that whole thing aside, that's really all that's changed in the code. Everything else is a very simple receive the uh, data, write it out. Well, here I'm mapping it from 0 to 255, and that goes to 1,000 to 2,000. That's how a pulse width work works that's a whole theory for a different video on the actual actuators outside of that uh there's a debug prompt the debug prompt's currently enabled but when i'm fielding the robots i disable it because it makes the loop run that much smoother and that much more efficiently and now onto the transmission side of things now the nunchuck uh, we are still importing the same nrf 24l libraries we're also importing Arduino nunchuck.h. Unfortunately, this is not a repo that is in the uh, libraries folder or the libraries manager of Arduino. However, there is a GitHub for it. I will have it linked down below. And I'm also going to distribute this via the GPL license within my zip folder I will have on my Patreon of all the relevant files for this project. Back to the code. This nunchuck variable sets up the fact that you want to use nunchuck as nunchuck. Uh, this is the pipe for the NRF24L. This is the same address that we have over here. So that way the transmitter is transmitting that address and the receiver knows that that packet's destined for it. One detail here, if you're using an RF Nano and not an NRF module connected to an Arduino Nano, the RF Nano being an all-in-one board, you need to set the CSI, CSR, I forget the exact terminology, these bits here, to 10 9. It's really common in code examples for that to be 9 10. This tripped me up when I first assembled this back a couple of years ago for a good hour or two because I didn't understand why my radio wasn't working. I did everything as it was supposed to. I used a very basic ping pong example or Senac example and it didn't work. I changed 9 and 10 around and it worked perfectly. This isn't documented on the RF Nano uh, uh, documentation or anything. I basically took a wild guess and was right. After that, we have all of the channels being initialized with one, that safe value of 127 again. Uh, and then the kill switch value is being set to one out of the gate. So that way, as soon as you boot up the controller, it is broadcasting kill switch equals one, meaning the kill switch is active, meaning the robot won't move. And then we set up the data structure immediately after that, byte kill switch, all the channels. And then we get into void setup, we're initializing the radio. And then we are initializing serial here. And that basically is just for debugging. Uh, that gives me this nice prompt over here with all of my data outputs so I can sanity check everything. The nunchuck gets initialized. After that, we're saying my data is my data. This is just saying that this packet here of my data is the data we're actually writing. Then we immediately get into the kill switch code. Again, I set up the kill switch first. I want the kill switch to be the first thing active so that the robot has zero chance of moving while the system is booting. And basically I'm just checking if the C button, which is the top little circle button here, is being pressed. And if it is, that will set the kill switch to zero, meaning that the robot is allowed to move. Now, otherwise the kill switch is automatically set back to one if that button's released. 
Then we get into the loop, we have nunchuck update. That's just requesting that the nunchuck send its data uh, or it's pulling the I squared C bus for the nunchuck data. Again, kill switch is invoked and then joystick is invoked. If we go down here to void joystick, that is basically just, so I have a special prompt here. When my Z button is pressed, the robot goes into turbo mode. Now that's basically a fancy way of saying the robot has its throttle limits removed. Again, I use this controller for when I'm working in an indoor environment and I want really fine, precise, reliable control. So normally I have the throttle capped to about 60 to 70% when you're not holding that button. If you hold that button, it uncaps it and the robot runs like a bat out of hell. And so that's what I've got set up here. I'm basically checking if the Z button is pressed and if it isn't, then channel one, which is the X axis, so left, right, gets mapped from 28 to 240 to 197 to 57. Now, let me tell you a bit about this. A map is all, all the map is doing is scaling the values zero to 255 from zero to 255 or zero 255 to 127, 27, or whatever you set it up. It basically just scales that linearly. Now, why I'm using these values specifically, I probably should have these broken out into variables to make it a little more grokkable. No two controllers are exactly alike. There are tolerances and the potentiometers and everything. And so when you go all the way to the left, you're not actually hitting the ideal value of zero. You're hitting, in this case, 255, or no, in this case, 28. If you go all the way to the right, you're not hitting the ideal value of 255, you're hitting 240. And so I'm basically setting the lower and high end because if I just set that from zero to 255, I would have less resolution and I wouldn't ultimately hit the max speed of the robot because it's not scaled appropriately to use the whole control width. There's basically parts of the controller you can't use. Imagine having a piece of a wood block under your throttle pedal in a car. You go to put your foot all the way down, you're not getting the full throttle. It's that same concept. We're just pretending that wood block isn't there by making the control range. The, the full throttle value now becomes here instead of here. And we're doing the same thing on the Y axis. And now the values 197 to 57 are the uh, lower and higher throttle limits of the throttle for forward and reverse. So maximum speed would be 255 forward. Maximum speed reverse would be zero. And I'm remapping those to be 197 and 57, so I'm getting about 60 to 70% of my throttle. We're doing the exact same thing if the Z button is pressed, except instead of topping out at 70% throttle, we're going full throttle, 255. And after that, we have the debug prompt again. All I'm doing here is making it look fancy. That's what you see over here. It is basically just constantly updating in a reasonably human readable way. You've got the kill switch, the turbo switch, the left right value, the front rear value, and also I used raw joystick values for determining what the upper and lower limits of my map are. Now there are ways to determine the upper and lower limits automatically. You can set up, like a lot of RC controllers do, a, uh, a calibration routine. However, for something like this where I'm making it a one-off, it's easier to not do that and just manually see, oh, my upper limit's 255, oh, my lower limit's 12, or whatever, and put those in the code manually. I might actually end up writing the calibration routine mainly because I want to know how to do it and I might use it for a future project, but that's basically it. It is a really, it's a relatively trivial way to get a fairly reliable and robust control system. Now you'll probably notice I had a high emphasis on the safety and controllability because I, like I said, I want to be able to drive this in an area with people and I, the worst thing I want to happen is for the robot to not work. I would rather have to carry the robot back to the hotel room or back to the car or whatever and not have it break someone's ankles. Now this robot isn't quite as crazy as some of my earlier robots, which were excessive. Uh, General Chaos, the one with the robot arm, that thing could tow a car, and I have done that. And so this robot's about 60 pounds instead of 260 pounds, and it is just a lot more compact, a lot more lightweight, and while it is pretty quick, it really wouldn't do much more than bruise someone's shin if it actually hit you. 
and I'm going to be adding foam bumpers front and rear to protect from that as well. But ideally, it doesn't hit anyone because there is very little way for things to go wrong enough that the robot would act out. I've thought through those issues. The only other concern, like I said, is security, is someone is an active attempt to thwart the robot instead of passive interference from Wi-Fi or something like that. And that's something I want to experiment a lot more with is encryption and so on on Arduino platforms. If you have any resources on that or any suggestions or you've experimented with encryption on Arduino stuff uh, yourself, please let me know down below in the comments. Like I said, all the project files will be available. Uh, that link will be in the description as well. And I think that's it. Let me know if you have any comments or questions. I've been Glitch. This has been Hack5. That's been General Chaos. Glitch out. Thanks for supporting Hack5. Find all our shows, community, and Pentest products at hack5.org.